Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Joan Fontaine in James Hilton's Random Harvest on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories. Chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a dramatization of my own novel, Random Harvest, starring that brilliant young actress, Joan Fontaine. You know, for years I've been queried by both friends and strangers. How do you get an idea for a story? Well, there are many ways. But in the case of Random Harvest, I'd like to put myself in the position of one of the characters and go back to a moment when I met a man on a train whom I shall call Charles Rainier. But that's our story. And before we begin, Frank Oss, how about a few words from you about Hallmark? There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays... Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy, there is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting James Hilton's Random Harvest, and starring Joan Fontaine. <laughs> What first attracted me to Charles Rainier was an air of mystery about his eyes which intrigued. He seemed always to look beyond you, as if in the dark recesses of his memory he was groping for something he couldn't find. Shortly afterwards, I met his wife. Her face had a beauty that poured into it from within, a secret and serene radiance. On casual observance, the marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Rainier seemed ideal. But as I came to know them better, I sensed a dramatic undercurrent between them, as if these two people were hiding something from each other. During the ensuing two years, Charles and I became very close friends, and I discovered why he always looked beyond you. It was very exciting, but I was unable to start writing about it. The story had a beginning, a middle, but lacked an ending. Until one afternoon, when I dropped in for a visit at the Rainier estate, and Mrs. Rainier called me into her library. I'm so happy you dropped in, Mr. Hilton. As a matter of fact, I was going to telephone you. Well, this is an opportune visit. Where's Charles? Off somewhere, and as usual, I never know just when he'll return. Well, it's pleasure enough just to see you. Uh, what were you going to phone me about? Forgive me for prying, but why did you and Charles drive out to Melbury the other night? What you're asking will hurt you deeply. Tell me, please. Charles is a man in search of a memory. For a long time now, he has desperately sought to remember the events of the year 1919, when he was an amnesia victim. And he's found them? Not quite all. But he now knows that during that last year, he fell madly in love with a girl and married her. And it all began where, while he was at a hospital in Melbury. Does he remember her clearly, what she looked like, her name? I'm not sure, but I do know that he'd give up everything if he could find her. He'd give up everything? Well, Mr. Hilton, thank you for telling me all this. I'm so sorry. You know, when I try to imagine your feelings... I don't feel anything yet, at least not much. Would you excuse me? I believe I'll go for a drive. Do you mind if I come along? If you like. Would you be good enough to ask Sheldon to bring the car? Of course. Uh, one thing, Mrs. Rainier. People are remembered as they were last seen, and 20 years is a long time. It would be a miracle. I wish there were such a miracle. Twenty years, twenty years ago. It was at Melbury, Armistice Day. 
I remember. bother with him, Missy. He's from the Army Hospital. One of them loony ones, I think. Oh, come on, soldier. Let's be gay. We've won a war. Please, I... Uh, oh, uh, come on, old boy. It's all right if you don't like it. Here, we'll, we'll go for a walk. Go where it's quiet. Talk or not, whichever you like. Come on, let's go. I'm not really loony, like the man said. I said... Did you hear that? I said it clearly, didn't I? Of course you did. But you don't know what a job I have as a rule. I've had to learn to talk all over again. I still have a fear of being around too many people. Oh, you'll do all right. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Well, this street doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Neither does my life. You did escape from the hospital, didn't you? No, not exactly. I just came out because... Of, well, because there were no guards at the gate. It's like a prison, isn't it? I loathe it. Well, then you oughtn't to be in it, surely. Well, there's nowhere else until I... I get all right again. Well, how can you get all right when you're not happy there? Mm, perhaps I shouldn't be very happy anywhere. No. Well, why not go back to your family? I was shell-shocked. I lost my memory of the past. Oh. Oh, don't worry. I have doctors say I, I'll regain it, but there's no telling when. What's your name? Paula. Paula Ridgeway. It's not my real name, though. I'm, I'm an actress with a traveling troupe. What's yours? Smith. But that's not real, either. Well, Smith, good enough. Hello, Smithy. Hello, Paula. Listen, Smithy. Smithy, I've got a crazy idea. I suppose you'll, you'll think it's silly, but then everybody's gone silly today. Smithy, you're not going back to that horrible hospital. Oh, I... I have to go oh, back. Come along with the troop. Let us be your family until you can remember your own. Well, the hospital will find me wherever I go. Oh, no, they won't. I won't let them. But you don't know who I am. For all you know, I might be really loony or, or, or dangerous. Well, then again, you might just be an earl or a lord or something. I've always wanted to be one. <laughs> oh, you, you're quite a girl. Oh, it would be wonderful. Well, then it's all said. You're coming with us. But I... But, Smithy, you won't have a care. Smithy will... What's the matter? It's nothing. If I... Could sit down for a moment. I'm sure I'll be all right. Sure you will, old boy. I'll help you. Smithy was very ill. I took him to my lodgings, and for weeks we both fought to make him well. And as the days wore on and Smithy's strength slowly returned... I began to really know and understand him. He was fine and decent, and I fell in love with him. And though he never told me, I knew he was in love with me, too. Then, when Smithy was much better, it was time for the troop to leave Melbury. <coughs> Smithy, Smithy, there are two men from the hospital downstairs. Hurry up and get your things together. We're leaving. No, Paula. Well, they'll come up here and take you back with them. Is that what you want? Perhaps. You see, Paula, I can't continue being a burden to you, taking everything and giving nothing. Smith I, I need you. Oh, you need me. I, I'd only be in the way. Oh, no, Smithy. I spoke to our company manager, and he's, he's agreed to give you a job. Oh, I... I can't, Paula. Well, are you still afraid to face people? It, it can't be that you haven't courage. You proved you wanted to live while you were it sick. It isn't so much fear of them as a sort of... uneasiness. As if I oughtn't really to be alive, and everybody knows it and wonders why I still am. I... I've got to feel before I can free myself. Smithy, I'll tell you something. If you oughtn't to be here, neither should I, and I wouldn't be but for luck. A house I was living in was hit by a bomb. I was asleep in one room, and two people were killed in the next. I wasn't going to tell you that. I thought it might upset you, but now maybe it'll cheer you up to know we're both alike. We're both living on borrowed time. We've nothing to lose. Are you coming? <laughs> Smithy became one of us, scene painter, copywriter, general manager, and whatnot. He had a flair for writing and even wrote some new material for the troupe. With a little understanding, his shyness towards strangers was soon won over. 
We saw a great deal of each other during these busy days, and suddenly he seemed to change. For once he depended on me, and I went out of his way to avoid me. And then one day, without so much as a goodbye, he was gone. I searched for him and found him the following day at a place called Beeching's Over. Unshaven and haggard looking, he was asleep on top of a hill. Wake up, Smithy. Hmm? Oh, Paula, why did you follow me here? Smithy, why did you run out on me yesterday? Because I can do without you. I know I can. Oh, I must. Fiddlesticks, don't boast, old boy. I can do without you, too, for that matter. Oh, let's be independent as all that. Or get out. Let's each fly in different directions and wonder why for the rest of our lives. Oh, Smithy, what have you got against oh, me? Oh, how could I have anything against you? Except for the same reason I couldn't. Mm, too subtle, darling, unless you tell me what the reason is. I love you. Smithy, you do? You do, really? Oh, I loved you ever since I first set eyes on you. As soon as I saw you, the very first moment. Oh, darling, darling, I'm so happy. Paula. When I'm fully recovered and I find a job that can support both of us, will you marry me? Oh, darling, I, I think it only takes two weeks that they make your way. Oh, but I, I'm not right yet. Besides, besides, wouldn't they ask me a lot of questions at the marriage license bureau? You mean questions about yourself that you couldn't answer? <clears throat> yes. They might ask you one question. I never have, and that is if you've been married before. Well, of course I haven't. How can you be certain, old boy, with that awful memory of yours? We were married at St. Clement's, Vale Street, London, and we moved into a rickety old attic, and our fondest dream was to build a house atop a hill that meant so much to us at Beeching's Over. We never returned to the troop. Smithy began to write. Oh, and we were blissfully happy, and to add to it, a few weeks later, a letter came from a very important publisher asking that Smithy appear in person. Oh, we were in heaven as the train pulled in that was to take Smithy to Liverpool. Oh, Smithy, I'll miss you. Well, come along. We're rich, darling. <laughs> Only in happiness. Well, it doesn't matter if we can't afford it. You know something? Hmm. I've not lost only my memory. I lost my heart to you. Oh, hurry, darling. I'm only half alive while you're away. We belong to the same world. Oh, I know that, too. There's something right about it. I adore you, Smithy. You know I don't want to remember anything now, anything I've ever forgotten. It would be so unimportant. My life began with you and my future goes on with you. There's nothing else, Paula. Oh, what a lovely thing to tell me. Darling, I love you. Oh, I love you, too, always. Oh, there's the whistle. I better get inside. Goodbye, Paula. Goodbye. Oh, darling, come back soon. I will. It'll only be a week. Goodbye. But Smithy didn't come back in a week. Or the next week. Or the week after that. Forever. In a moment, we will present the second act of James Hilton's famous novel, Random Harvest, starring Joan Fontaine. Of all the English poets, few have rivaled Samuel Taylor Coleridge in power of imagination and ability to use words to make imagined things seem real. Perhaps his words are so effective because what he imagined seemed so real to him. For as he once remarked to a group of younger men, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. We see how true this is when we look at Hallmark greeting cards and read the messages they bear. There is such a sincerity about them. You know the one you select will carry your thought truly, whether it's a message of sympathy, a remembrance for some holiday or anniversary, or just a cheerful greeting to let a friend or loved one know you care. And what is true of the words of a Hallmark greeting card is just as true of everything else about it, the way it's designed, 
the materials it's made of, the way it's put together. That is why you always find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. Look for the Hallmark on the back when you choose greeting cards. That tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now we return to the second act of James Hilton's Random Harvest, starring Joan Fontaine. My frantic search for Smithy began in Liverpool at the office of the publisher with whom he had the appointment. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith. Your husband never kept his engagement. I never saw him. Please, Doctor, did he return to the hospital here in Melbury? No, we've never had word of him since the day he escaped. Please, please, can't you please help me? I'm desperate. We've tried everything. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith. He just couldn't disappear off the face of the earth. We printed his description on the front page. There's been no response. Sorry. Anything, just tell me he's alive. My advice to you is to save your money. When your investigators fail, better give up. The following eight years, I merely existed, but I never stopped searching. Then, one day, June 10th, 1929, I picked up a newspaper, and on the front page was a picture of Smithy. I cried with joy, and I didn't care who was watching. I read the caption below the picture, Charles Rainier, industrialist, member of the House of Commons, will speak there today. He had discovered his former identity. He was alive. Smithy was alive! Oh, I rushed over to the House of Commons, but I was too late to get in. So I went to the private entrance reserved for members and waited for him. Uh, did you call me, miss? I say, uh, when will he be out? Uh, who, lady? Smithy. Lady, there's no Smithy in the House of Commons. Oh, yes, I, I am sorry. I, I mean, Charles Rainier. Well, session's over. He'll be out soon. Are you sure he'll come out this door? You a friend of his? More than a friend. Don't worry. Charles Rainier will come out of this door. Mm. Calling me? Uh, no, Mr. Rainier, but there's a lady waiting here who says she's a friend of yours. Friend? I don't believe we've ever met, young lady. No, I, I suppose not. I, I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Rainier. Mm, that's quite all right. Good day. <laughs> I wanted to follow him, throw my arms around him, and try by sheer force to bring back the memory of the year that we'd spent so happily together. And then the realization came to me. He had recovered his memory once before. Perhaps if I could be near him, it, it would happen again. I secured employment as a typist in Rainier Enterprises. I became Helen Hansley. And there I learned how he regained his memory. In Liverpool, he was struck by an automobile. And the shock restored his identity of Charles Rainier. After working there for six months, I learned that his personal secretary was leaving. I knew I had to get that position. But then I'd be close to him, be able to talk to him, awaken some spark in his memory of the past. <clears throat> yes, what is it? Uh, Mr. Rainier, I... Uh... Well, don't be shy. Speak oh. up. Mr. Rainier, I understand your secretary has left, and I'd like you to know that without a doubt, if you were to look all over, you wouldn't find anyone more qualified to fill the vacancy. I, I can type at the rate of 80 words a minute, and I take dictation as fast as you can talk. I have my book right One here. One moment, there. Miss... Uh, uh, Hanslet. I uh, handle people intelligently on the phone, and I, I'm well-versed in politics. I'm a conservative by choice. My punctuation is perfect, and oh, I, I make rather a presentable appearance. It's important to the job, you know. What's more, I... I'll answer that. Mm, if you don't mind, I'll do it myself. Yes? Oh, have a come in. No bother inviting me in. Hello, my precious. <laughs> Hello, Kitty, darling. Oh, uh, this is Miss Hanslet, my uh, new secretary. I'm hired. Oh, you hired me, Mr. Rainier. Oh, no. You hired yourself. Well, that makes two of us that have bested you, Charles. 
Miss Hanslet, you chose to be his secretary. I chose to be his wife. Wife? We'll be married in two weeks. And would you believe it, I had to propose to him. In fact, he dodged me so long, I accused him of being in love with another woman. <laughs> I trapped you, didn't I, darling? Completely and overwhelmingly. Miss Hanslet, will you take care of the wedding list and advise the press? Yes, of course, my... Congratulations to you both. This was the end of a dream that had kept me alive all these years. I wanted to run someplace, any place, blot out all the memories that kept crowding into my mind. But in the same moment, I knew my destiny was to remain here beside him, even if only as a secretary. I... I could never turn back. For the, for the next ten years, I tried not to think. I, I was useless. And then the letter was delivered to me by a special messenger marked Charles Rainier, personal. A, a letter marked personal, Mr. Rainier. Mm, read it to me, please. I believe it's from your fiancé. Read it, won't you, please? You're my secretary. You'll know the contents sooner or later, anyhow. My dear Charles, I'm writing this in a hurry, but after thinking things out as slowly and carefully as even you could... I decided, I decided that, that I, I can't, can't marry you. I'm not the one for you. Though Lord knows the mistake was excusable for both of us. Because I'm nearly the one. I claim that much. And it's something to go on being proud of. But nearly isn't enough for a lifetime. And here's something else that may sound utterly absurd. But let me say it. Sometimes, especially when we've been closest... I've had a curious feeling that I remind you of someone else. Someone you may have met or may yet meet. How could Kitty know? How could she tell? It's true, there is someone else. If I only knew. If only I could remember. Oh, I beg your pardon, Miss Hanslet. I... How could I possibly make you understand when I can't even explain it to myself? <laughs> For the next two years, I felt Charles drawing close to me, as if the veil across his memory were about to lift. But as quickly as these moments came, they would be gone and our relationship would continue in the same polite yet distant manner. I became more than just his secretary. He sought my advice, relied on me to fulfill social obligations. And then one day, while he and I were lunching... I'm all for the merger, Miss Hanslet. I agree. Only make them come to you. Did it ever occur to you how indispensable you are to me? <laughs> I'd like to think I am. Miss Hanslet, Helen, I'd like to submit a plan to you. You sound as if you're about to make a, a political speech. Well, it would be less difficult. <laughs> Helen, will you marry me? Will you repeat that? Oh, don't misunderstand. I don't expect that you're in love with me. You are in love with me? I have great respect and admiration for you. I see. The fact is, I... I feel that you're necessary to me in countless ways. You're a born hostess. I've watched you handle people. Yes, I'm very adept at that sort of thing. And you'll accept my plan? Yes, Mr. Rainier. Charles. Splendid. Of course, you needn't worry about... The... I know. We'll just call it a marriage of convenience. <laughs> times during these years of our marriage, I wanted to go to him, tell him who I really was, but I didn't want to force him to love me. I knew if he were ever to know and love me again, he would have to find the way back himself, or not at all. Are you ready for the drive, Mrs. Rainier? Yes, Mr. Hilton. Oh, yes. Where would you like to go? To a lovely place I know called Beechings Over. This hill looks as if it had never changed. I don't suppose it has much in a thousand years. That makes 20 seem only yesterday. 20? Mrs. Rainier, what do you mean? Do you mind if I go the rest of the way myself? 
I can see the summit from here. But Charles has told me about this hill. What does this place mean to you? My life and my dreams. Hello. Wake up. I was just resting and... Helen, what on earth are you doing here? I might ask you the same question. I was out driving and I passed this hill. Somehow I had the oddest feeling that I'd been here before. Had you? Helen, I think... Oh, Smithy, Smithy. Smithy? Smithy? Helen! Paula! Oh, Paula, darling! I saw them embrace, and I knew then that the gap was closed, that the random years were at an end, that the past and the future would join. I had the ending to my story, and now I could begin to write it. Before James Hilton and Joan Fontaine return, what do you say we play a little quiz game? Ready for the question? Here it is. What friends of yours or members of your family are having birthdays soon? Think hard now. There's sure to be two or three. Perhaps several if you look ahead to March and April. Now just think how much pleasure it will give each of these friends and loved ones to receive a birthday greeting from you this year. Of course, you'd want to send a cheery message to one friend, perhaps a humorous greeting to another, a reminder of your affection to anyone who is especially dear to you. No matter, you always find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. Now, I said we were going to play a quiz game, so of course there must be a prize. Well, the prize you'll win by sending Hallmark birthday cards is the gratitude and affection of all you send them to. You'll even win a special measure of appreciation as friends notice the Hallmark on the back of the cards they receive from you. For that tells them you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Before we close the Hallmark Playhouse for tonight, there are some things I'd like to say about the wonderful performance we've heard here this evening. You see, I knew the heroine of our play tonight longer than anyone. I want to say right here that you, Miss Joan Fontaine, made her the character I wanted her to be. Thank you for such a splendid portrayal. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Paula was a wonderful girl who had the courage to try to weave the past and the present together. Her thoughtfulness, her tenderness... And understanding helped create a happy life for someone she loved. But now I'm talking in terms you Hallmark people seem to understand so well. For your greeting cards deal with thoughtfulness and understanding between friends and loved ones. And I want to thank you for asking me to be here tonight and for giving me the opportunity to play in one of your own fine works. We're happy to have you here any time, Miss Fontaine. Next Thursday, we'll have Edna Ferber's fine story, So Big, starring Virginia Bruce. And the following week, Barclay Square, starring David Niven. And the week after that, a new American bestseller, Meredith Wilson's book with the delightful title, And There I Stood with My Piccolo, starring Meredith Wilson himself. <laughs> our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And tonight's script was adapted by Jack Rubin. So until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards, when you care enough to send the very best. Joan Fontaine is currently appearing throughout the country in the Rampart picture, You've Gotta Stay Happy. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.